So let me start getting into the meat of this now by making distinctions between three basic kinds of practices that are commonly called meditation. Remember, there are lots of other things people call meditation, but these are three you can find in almost all traditions. One is what we might call concentrative meditation, where the basic idea is to put the mind on one thing and when it wanders away, come back there. The second is what we might call mindfulness meditation. Now, you know, the Buddhist term vipassana is a good term for it too. And rather than holding the mind fixed to one particular thing, three qualities are striven for in the naturally occurring flow of experience. The qualities of clarity, that is to pay closer receptive attention to what actually goes on from moment to moment. The quality of breadth, that instead of only paying attention to the things you like, you really try to pay attention to the whole flow of your experience. And the quality of equanimity, the quality of instead of, I don't like that, make it go away, or I, I want it, give me more. The quality of just trying to let things happen as they want to happen while you pay clear, broad attention to it. So that's mindfulness or Vipassana meditation. And then the third category, which tends to interest me even more, is what we might call mindfulness in life. Where again, as in Vipassana, you go for that clarity, breadth, and equanimity of attention, but you do it as part of your everyday life rather than when you're sitting on a special black cushion in a special room called a zendo or something like that. Uh, I personally think this is extremely important and not given enough attention because while the formal sitting meditation practices of Vipassana can lead to a great deal of clarity during the sessions, for most people it disappears rather quickly the moment they get up. It takes a long time to generalize out to ordinary life. You know, but very few of us ever gotten in trouble while we were sitting on a cushion. It's when we got up and started opening our mouth and walking and talking that we got into a lot of trouble. That's where the mindfulness is much more strongly needed than on the cushion. So I'm particularly interested in this third one because it speeds up this generalization of mindfulness to life. Now, I said I'd tell you about my personal experiences with meditation to both show you my possible biases in approaching it. This is sort of the full disclosure fashion. And to illustrate some of the problems with it. I started trying various forms of meditation probably about the time I was a teenager. I read about it in books and would sit down and try things. And most meditation instructions I read began, can I have the next slide please, Cindy Lou? Began with first quiet your mind and then, and I never got past that first step of first quiet your mind. Uh, it's easy to say, okay, here, Maggie is multitasking, so she can be in time for a class where she learns how to do nothing. Seem a little bit familiar somehow? Talk about multitasking. Well, this was discouraging to try all these techniques and discover mainly that my mind was racing about. Clearly, I wasn't very talented at doing this sort of thing. It wasn't for lack of traditionally good instruction. I had had, besides all the book reading I did, I'd had instructions from very good teachers like Lama Govinda or Dira Vamsa or Tarthang Tolku. But I just could never get past that first step of clearing my mind. I remember keeping a meditation diary and sometimes when I would have two seconds without my mind being full of thoughts, I would write that down with exclamation points because this was a really heavy duty meditation day. I was especially interested in uh, an introductory meditation class I took with Tarthang Tulku at the Nyingma Institute up in Berkeley. I took it three times actually and he wouldn't let me take it the fourth time but I said I still didn't get it, I needed the beginning class, he made me take the advanced one. But he used to talk about this concept that was so interesting, the space between thoughts. I found that a fascinating concept. But it had absolutely no reality to me because there was no space between my thoughts. Uh, I've, I've since found there actually can be a space between thoughts. But. And in fact, the next uh, slide illustrates that problem a little bit more. So this would bring bells with a lot of you. You start thinking about something, and you think about your thoughts, and you think about your thinking about your thinking about your thoughts, and you think, 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 and pretty soon you and all of reality are totally lost. Think, 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 think. So maybe I just had bad karma, 
right? Maybe I wasn't suited for meditation. I've been so wicked and mean and heedless in previous lifetimes that I, I just won't be able to learn to do it. Or maybe it's because I'm bad at accepting authority. You know, I'm the kind of guy who keeps asking teachers questions. You know, out of attempting to understand, not out of hostility, but maybe I don't have the surrender attitude that would make it work. I don't know. Then along in the 70s, Transcendental Meditation came along. And I thought their advertising was a little hokey at times, but they did have a consistent theme that said, in essence, Transcendental Meditation will work for you even if you're an idiot. And I thought, OK, I, am a, I have proven that I'm an idiot when it comes to meditation, so I'll try it. Could I have the next slide, please, Cindy Lou? I did it for a year and a half and eventually ended up writing an article on it. Is that a good meditation when you can write an article on it? This is in an old issue of the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology. I found it actually did things for me. It didn't do the things I expected, but it sort of processed old stuff that hadn't been worked out and was kind of relaxing. It was sort of a purification of consciousness, and I rather liked it. So I did that for about a year and a half. Shortly after that, I discovered an entirely different approach, the work of G.I. Gurdjieff. Could I have the next slide, please, Cindy? Gurdjieff was one of the pioneers in trying to adapt Eastern teachings to Westerners. He trained in many different systems in the East and then began teaching in the West. Um, I think he must have felt he was going crazy sometimes. But, oh, these Westerners, they just don't get it, but all right, let's try it this way and see what happens. He was an experimenter. And he taught a system of mindfulness in everyday life that did not require you to quiet your mind first, but just begin paying attention in a specialized way to what was going on into your own body. I got a great deal out of it. And I, worked in that in various groups for many years. I've written three books that talk about this particular thing. And the mindfulness course I teach here at ITP is also based mainly on Gurdjieff's techniques. And I'm very pleased with that mindfulness course. I, when I first tried teaching it, I wasn't at all sure it would work. Because for all the wonderful things we do here, the meditation traditions would say one of our prime problems is that we live in dreams and fantasies and ideas and hopes and fears. And boy, we give such a good diet of new fantasies here at ITP. Not just ordinary fantasies, but transcendent fantasies that'll get you enlightened. So I thought, could I actually teach any students to notice where their body was at a given moment? To notice the trash on the floor of the classrooms, which is so prevalent with lots of intuitive types around? And it's worked. <laughs> It's worked out very well. Uh, the students act, I don't know what happens to them after they leave, but they have learned to come to, their, to the present moment, to live in their bodies, to use their senses, and it's been very effective. Now, I don't teach Gurdjieff work, per se. I'm not an official part of any Gurdjieff tradition, or any other spiritual tradition, for that matter. I'm not authorized to do anything. I'm just me doing, uh, trying to teach what I think I understand and pass it along. Uh, same thing applies to Buddhism or the like. And that's all right with me. I'm not, a, I'm not a very good follower type. And besides, both Buddha and the Gurdjieff basically had very scientific attitudes toward their practices. They said, don't believe me. Don't worship me. Try these things and see if they work. The Buddha, for instance, in his Sutta to the Kalamas said, do not believe in anything simply because you have heard it. Do not believe in traditions because they've been handed down for many generations. Do not believe in anything because it is spoken and rumored by many. Do not believe in anything simply because it is found written in your religious books. Do not believe in anything merely on the authority of your teachers and elders. But after observation and analysis, when you find that anything agrees with reason and is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. I resonate with that attitude. That makes perfect sense. All, toward all the spiritual wisdom traditions, you know, which have so much to say about meditation, I believe that there were people who lived in those traditions, and some of whom are still living, who certainly knew an awful lot about meditation, an awful lot about transpersonal reality. But I'm not sure that anybody knew everything. I, mean, I don't know if anybody was enlightened, whatever enlightened me. And certainly people knew some important things that we should learn from. But for me, I have to try things out, 
see what works and does it work. Going back to the fact I got so much out of the Gurdjieff work, for instance, but the books I've written about it and the things I teach about it are about the psychological aspects of it that I've been able to check out in my own experience. There's a cosmology and stuff in there that I don't have the slightest idea whether it's far more profound than I can understand or whether it's pure nonsense. So I don't teach that stuff. I don't understand that.